The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested every last close just Whoa, 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 what was that? Some of you must be thinking, and that, my friends, is the new THC theme song. I wrote the lyrics, and I hired some musicians to perform it, and I think it turned out pretty good. And I was in need of an update. Some people complain the original hurt their ears, and I get that. I also didn't have the rights to the background track I spoke over, so this had to happen. It's also shorter, which is better, too, in the long run. But that said, here we go, our side chatters, drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke, and trying to find balance in this world of chaos. Today is the treat of treats because, number one, it's another two-guest show, and that alone is a reason to pop the champagne. But this show came to be because one of my guests, Matthew Cross, was someone I met on the Armenia tour. We had plenty of time to talk over the two weeks there, and I thought Matthew was a pretty insightful and well-spoken guy. We had a good time tearing up the American education system and talking about sacred knowledge, which is a bit of a specialty of Matthew's, and his friend and co-author, Dr. Bob Friedman, who also joined us. It took me the first two questions to really dial in the sound, but that's always a bit of a struggle with two guests. I got it sorted out quick, so don't worry. And I found their perspective to be pretty compelling. We have all heard of the golden ratio and Fibonacci sequence at this point, but I think there's a lot more to it than just the formation of a sunflower or the composition of the Mona Lisa. There are applications you can use in your own life and in the era of biohacks and seeking human optimization, this might be the sweet spot. So let's do the damn thing. Digging into the natural codes of health, wealth, and everything else with Matthew Cross and Dr. Robert Friedman. Enjoy. I got a new life. You would hardly recognize me. I'm so glad. Now I'm amazing. I don't care about you. Why do I bother when you're not in the club with me? All right, everybody, we are well aware the material world unfolds in accordance with particular patterns and sacred geometry, and we've talked about that underlying code that Program Universe runs on, but today we're going to get a sense of just how deep that rabbit hole goes. How can we use this information in a practical way? How does it relate to areas like health and success, and what exactly do those Masons know that we don't? With me to explore these questions and more is my main man, Matthew Cross, president of Leadership Alliance, an international consulting firm where he works with Fortune 100 companies. He's been researching practical applications for the Golden Ratio since the man was only 12 years old. I was lucky enough to get to hang with Matthew over our two weeks in Armenia as he was part of the group with me on the Graham Hancock tour. He's also the author of books like The Hoshin Success Compass, The Millionaire's Map, and Be Your Own President. But that's not all, folks. With us also on the line behind door number two is Dr. Robert Friedman, who practiced nutritional and preventative medicine for 25 years before turning his attention to the application of the Golden Ratio to health and longevity. Together, the dynamic duo has authored the Golden Ratio Lifestyle Diet, The Divine Code of Da Vinci, Fibonacci, Einstein, and You, and the book Matthew was kind enough to give me back in the old country, The Golden Ratio and Fibonacci Sequence, Golden Keys to Your Genius, Health, Wealth, and Excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, two guys who do more before noon than I probably do all day, fellas, welcome to THC. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a million, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, anytime, guys. It's great to have you here. Matthew, great to talk to you again. Now that the trip is over and you've had some time to think about it and let everything sink in, how did you like Armenia, man? What did you think of that trip? I thought Armenia was an absolute revelation, quite honestly, Greg. I mean, uh, a place that most people have forgotten, quite honestly, on the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I understand that at one time it was 10 times larger than it is today. It occupied, you know, 10 times the footprint on yeah. Earth than it does today. Um, but I just found it to be such an intriguing ancient land. It really felt like uh, it really felt like time travel in some ways, going back in time. We saw so many ancient monasteries. There was so much history, so much faith poured into these structures and into the land. 
and then getting to see uh, Karam was it Kar- Karamush? Karahunj. Karamush. Karahunj. Karahunj. <laughs> the Armenian Stonehenge, which for me was really one of the major highlights of the entire journey. Um, when I step back and look at at the photographs and just the feeling, you know, going there. What do we go there? Three in the morning. Right. And then with Graham, we had, we witnessed the rising of Orion over the Standing Stones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it was pretty amazing. Trip of a lifetime for sure. And I really enjoyed being in a place that's just so off the radar. And Graham kind of said it best, Armenia is a country that really needs help, and they have things of value, and they need the spotlight shined on them for it. And it was interesting to learn the history, because Armenian people are basically pacifists, which I guess is what I would be. But neighboring countries and invaders have definitely taken advantage of their passivity. But coming from America, it was cool just to be in a place that has the flip side of our attitude, and the ancient sites, though, that is really where it's at. They could rewrite the history books. Yeah, and it's another. That's an interesting angle to pick up there, Greg. Is that the 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 people in Armenia are not aggressors, you know, in a historical sense. They've been the ones who, in a sense, have been attacked and occupied and invaded. But they're coming from a different, a really different, peaceful place, is what I noticed. Yeah, I found the land and the the, the structures of the land and the ancient history of the land and the people to be just most inspiring. And of course, the pyramid we climbed. I mean, think about it. There's a pyramid within an hour of the capital city of Yerevan that's uh, nearly 100 feet tall, buried under tons of earth and vegetation, <laughs> right? And yet, you know, they're excavating at the top of this thing and figuring out, hey, wait a minute, this is a, this is a pyramid. This isn't a hill. This is an actual four-sided pyramid. yeah man that was definitely my first pyramid that i've been on so a bit of a milestone for me and and robert thanks for being here as well 25 years in preventative and nutritional medicine to me those are the two most important aspects and the aspects of health that we get very little education on in modern times and i'd say we're in the peak of non-nutritious food production but i guess let me ask how you've seen these two areas of of your practice change over the last 25 years Well, I was on the forefront of this back in the late 70s. I got out of medical school in 81 and then did a residency for three more years. But I always felt like a fish out of water because I was always oriented in this nutritional approach. So it was a little difficult being in that environment. And I was kind of a black sheep, but I I stuck to my guns and Everything that I learned about nutritional medicine, I learned after I got out of medical school and residency (laughs) because they certainly don't, they didn't used to teach it. I think it's changing a little bit now, but the field has burgeoned and it's just grown to the point where the average person is able to access so many of the things in spite of the fact that we're being bombarded on the other side with pesticides, herbicides, Mm chemtrails, you name it, electromagnetic bombardment. Um, So it's a real battle going on. And I don't know if we're going to make it, but um, we have a lot of tools at our disposal right now that we've never had before. So I'm optimistic. Right on, man. Yeah, it's medicine to me these days in the Western world is just reactionary. It's just reactive. It's run yourself into the ground. And then when something screws up, we'll just replace it like a car mechanic as best we can. And that's a terrible approach to uh, life and the human body, I'd say. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the group consciousness now has changed so much that the average person takes that point of view. So we're rapidly seeing a collapse of the status quo, everything from Obamacare to the rejection of pharmaceuticals and people's awareness of companies like Monsanto and the damage they're doing. So there's a lot going on. And we, Matthew and I took a kind of a different approach to it, kind of an energetic approach to alternative medicine. When we discovered the that the golden ratio, which has been around forever, obviously, mm-hmm. but one day we both had the epiphanies that this stuff could be used in practical applications in preventive medicine. And so that's what we've done over the last decade and a half is 
turn our attention to something that's only been used by people like Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it was in the Great Pyramids. Actually, all the pyramids have the golden ratio. Hmm. And a lot of the Fibonacci sequence numbers used in it. And we couldn't find it outside of art and architecture, really. So we had an epiphany that, wow, this stuff could really be used as a healing modality. And nobody had actually looked at it before. When I realized through my training that the human body was constructed along golden ratio proportions, that was my epiphany. And I wondered how deep the rabbit hole went. Was it just ratios of one bone to the next in Fibonacci and golden ratio? Or did it go deeper? And so that was my my approach in exploring this area over the last decade and a half. We looked into physiology. Uh, we looked into cholesterol ratios. We looked into sleep cycles, breathing rates, um, hydration, all sorts of different areas. And we were always looking through the lens of the golden ratio. And when you do, once you get that lens opened up, you see the world in a totally different way. Not just how you might look at a at a beautiful flower and be able to count the number of Fibonacci petals or spiraling cactuses or you know, innumerable examples. Mm-hmm in the physical realm, in the plant realm, but but in the physical body, it's it's mind-blowing. And we even have discovered that down to the DNA level, this golden ratio is present. And it's in the design of almost everywhere you look. It's just that people's eyes have been closed to this. And so part of our mission, it's not just the alternative medicine approach, but once people actually grok the profundity and the ubiquity of the golden ratio you don't just use it in your physical life in your healing but you can use it in whatever your um, avocation is or your vocation in life and so it's it's quite profound once you learn the secret of the golden ratio yeah, I think that's so interesting. It's so deep. And you're right. I mean, oftentimes when I hear about the golden ratio, it's it's measuring the petals in a flower or looking at your the ratio of your phalanges and your fingers. And it's like, yeah, that's pretty interesting, but I can't really do a whole lot with that. Exactly. Exactly. So I think what you guys are doing is, is pretty awesome. Matthew, studying the Fibonacci sequence since the age of 12. I mean, talk about things that are lacking from the modern education system. How did this stuff get on your radar at such a young age? Well, I had, I have very unusual parents. Uh, really, all begins there. I think if you know, I look at the the people who have made the biggest impact on my life. I mean, really, it's the same story with all of us. But it's it's my mom and dad. In my case, my mom, my mother was extremely interested, uh, going way back when I was still in single digits, in the true story of our history. So she was reading Eric von Daniken and Charles Berlitz and a whole host of authors when I was still in single digits and was absolutely and is absolutely intrigued about our real origins and the greater questions of our existence. And so, you know, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, I was growing up learning and and listening and just intrigued by the research that she was doing. So I was about age 12 going into 13 when my mom got a book on uh, The Secrets of the Great Pyramid by Peter Tompkins and a book called The New View Over Atlantis by John Mitchell. And those books, I, I started to read those books when I was 12, 13, 14, etc. And they were just an absolute epiphany, a very, very bright light into the ancient wisdom that's encoded in the structures across the globe. All the ancient structures are tied together by the same code, the same sacred geometry, the same formula, the golden ratio playing a pivotal uh, foundational element in their layout and their design. As Bob said, you know, the the, the structure of the Great Pyramid in, in Giza and in Egypt and the layout of Stonehenge. Well, you know, what do they have in common? The golden ratio <laughs> with jeweler's precision, by the way, Greg. And that intrigued me, okay, as a boy. And so I began a lifelong quest. 
from that point forward, I was absolutely intrigued. I read every single thing I could get my hands on. I ended up, my first trip to Europe in my early 20s was partially to meet John Michel, the author of these books. And I ended up connecting with him in Glastonbury at night over dinner in a pub. <laughs> I was in Europe for two weeks as a as a 22-year-old, and I had a backpack, and I was there for two weeks on a special ticket. And um, I caught up with him in Glastonbury, England. We had dinner. And um, it's a funny quick story, but the uh, pub we were having dinner at closed at about 10 o'clock at night. And I had a, I had a hostel that I was staying at, a youth hostel. And um, I walked to the hostel at about 10.30 at night. The town was completely deserted. And it was locked, closed, lights out, completely dark. It's March. And I ended up sleeping under a hedge <laughs> that, that <laughs> night. My quest to meet this professor. And they closed down the town. So I had to sleep under a hedge in the shadow of Glastonbury Tor. <laughs> in any event, um, for years and years and years, the research just kept pointing to its appearance in artwork and in structure. And to a certain degree in the philosophy, it echoed in the philosophy and principles of the ancient ones, the advanced civilization and peoples of times past. And it wasn't until the early 1990s that I came upon a book called Consistent Winning by a podiatrist in Texas who discovered that the Fibonacci sequence is literally the golden key, and the golden ratio is the golden key to human performance, athletic performance. In other words, when you train and rest according to the intervals dictated by the Fibonacci sequence, you can predict peak performance, hmm. whether you're a weekend athlete or you're an Olympic caliber uh, competitor, you can predict peak performance with extreme accuracy, let's say 85 to 90 percent accuracy, you can predict that on a certain day in the future, if you train according to the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio, you can predict that you'll turn in a fantastic performance when you need to. Well, I'm a runner. I'm an athlete. I've done mm -hmm. triathlons. I've run, you know, Boston Marathon. I've been competing in races for many years. And this was the first time I came upon a practical application that would have immediate impact to me. So I started training this way. And long story short, after taking second place in a handful of races uh, over a number of years, I ended up deploying this training system uh, and winning my first 5K road race in Connecticut. And then I won again. <laughs> so that was a fascinating you know, door into, hey, wait a minute. This is not just an aesthetic. Uh, it's not just aesthetically pleasing. It's not just a way to bring more harmony into one's uh, art or architecture, right, or poetry. Hey, wait a minute. This actually is a, also a key to human peak performance. And it mm -hmm. was around that time that Robert and I started to engage in some deep philosophical discussions about how, you know, what other ways might we practically engage, distill, right, and integrate this incredible principle for enlightenment, for health, for unity, for relationship. How else could we distill this and share this with the world? And so those conversations started happening in the late 90s. And then that led us literally on what's now going on, a, you know, a 20-year odyssey of distilling and fine-tuning and sharing our discoveries and research with the world, which up to this point has occupied four books mm -hmm. and um, is now about to now about to birth products. We're about to, to form, we've got formulations of nutritional products that are going to be formulated according to the golden ratio. Nice. So they, they actually perform a synergistic function in the body because their parts are put together with this unifying ratio. So that's a high level piece of going all the way back to a book, actually two books that my mom gave me that were great inspirations and kind of started that ripple effect in my life. <laughs> yeah, man, the butterfly effect. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. I wonder if the practical application of these things isn't what's being paid tribute to in the art and architecture. Maybe that's uh, something they knew, but they just couldn't spell out the same way da Vinci can put it into a painting or someone can code it into a cathedral. I mean, that's a, a way to pay tribute to it. But uh, Robert, talk to us a little bit about how the golden ratio does tie into health and diet. I mean, it, it must be pretty important for it to have become your focus. And I'm wondering what people can do to actually incorporate that into their life. How can they make changes according to the golden ratio that could be helpful? Well, let me just say one thing about uh, one of the reasons speculatively that 
da Vinci and some of the other great artists and some of the people in the Egyptian realm or other other builders of other pyramids was that um, in da Vinci's time, it may not have been safe and also preceding him to actually speak about the golden ratio. There was a lot of pressure from the church to suppress some of the sacred knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think the golden ratio fell into this realm. And so what happened, it, it was known among artists and architects, but they, the way they passed it on was through their works, their beautiful artworks and architectural works that have lasted through the centuries. I think that's important today because in the schools, we'll get to the, we can get to the um, medical stuff in just a few minutes, but just, I just didn't want to forget this point. Sure. That same mindset has been carried through the mindset of suppression. And that's the reason most people maybe have heard about the golden ratio, but that's as far as it went. Because in the schools, what should be one of the most prominent mathematical concepts is is not taught and it's not utilized. It may be, like I say, it may be mentioned in passing, but that's about it. But it's really not utilized and it's suppressed for whatever reason. And it's hard to blame it on any one person. It's more of a, I guess, it's more of a, a group mindset that's taken over. Although at some level there may be some individuals that actively um, are able to suppress it through, through their structure of educational curriculum. Yeah. And so that may still be going on. It probably is, but there is a renaissance going on and so many more people are interested in the golden ratio. And when people see something with the golden ratio in it, they're immediately struck by mm. its beauty or there's just something special about it. And that's why the interest has just blossomed in this uh, one area. So Matthew, you might ha want to have something. To, yeah. To yeah. To I'll, that I'll jump into this just quickly. And that's this. The reason the golden ratio lights us up, Greg, is that it's encoded within us again, down to the DNA, even down to a you know more micro level than that. It's encoded in the very structure and function of our entire body. Every heartbeat that all of us are having every moment of our lives is happening in golden ratio. The, the expansion and contraction of our heart is literally tuned when we're healthy to the golden ratio. So it's in us at a very, very deep level. And I would also suggest just, just to, to, to add a parallel thought to what Robert was just saying. The, you know, the church, for example, actively went after those who spoke about and tried to keep the pagan beliefs or the earth-based beliefs alive. Right. That was something that the church very, very strongly persecuted over history. And so the golden ratio is an integrative principle that really speaks to, again, the power and our connection to one another being within. So by definition, these elements, and as we know, you know, people like da Vinci and Michelangelo and all the rest, they had to encode, they had to hide in plain sight their understanding of these principles, right? Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, and this is a really critical point, the, the wisdom of the ancients was encoded in a language that we don't have the eyes to see today. It's right in front of us, right. but it's encoded in the language of geometry and the language of mathematics from a qualitative standpoint, the quality and ratios and proportions of the universe and of life, not so much the formulas and the left brain linear quantitative approach, which really in many ways is only, it's only telling one side of the story. Yeah. And when you just focus on the linear rote math, Mathematics, it actually dumbs people down, dumbs children down, turns them off to the more integrative, holistic, you know, big picture, holographic approach, mm -hmm. which is what the universe and life is all about. And that's great because then that lines them up to basically think lockstep linearly, be good soldiers and take orders. You know, the public school system in the West, the United States, for example, is predicated the actual foundation for schooling in our time in the United States, really fairly recent experiment. It's only 150 or so years old, but it was based on a group of educators back in the 1800s who went over to Europe, went to Prussia, and observed that the Prussian military model 
would be a great model for the public school system of America to turn out good students who would take orders, not question authority, fall lockstep into what the teacher was saying. And then when they come out of school, they'll then transfer that right into the factory. And again, that's literally the mindset we've all grown up in, most of us anyway. And so, you know, they say the fish is the last to discover water. Right. <laughs> the golden ratio is one of those. It's like a it's like a, a key to get out of the prison of the mind. <laughs> Most people have forgotten how powerful they are, how connected we all are. And this is one of those beautiful, brilliant, simple keys to that connection. Man, well said. Yeah. Obedient workers in the land of the free. That's what they wanted um, and what they got. <laughs> so. Guys, in your book, you say that vital capacity, which is the total amount of air exhausted after a full breath, is the number one predictor of longevity. Now, that's scary to me because I probably have the lung capacity of a 90-year-old man, but you know, whoever's forte this is can take the wheel. But let me know how breath and longevity can be connected to, to this and what we can do to improve this vital capacity. Well, Bob, Bob and I will tag team on this one, so I'm going to let him just jump in and I'll add some, some of my thoughts. Go for it, Bob. <laughs> okay. As far as the vital capacity goes, just to reiterate again, it's the amount of air that you, that you can exhale after a full breath. So basically, it's your lung capacity. And people might think that that's a static volume, but it's not. It can be changed just with some particular lung expansion exercises. And the greater your vital capacity, the longer you're going to live. We have an interesting graph in the book that shows a linear relationship between vital capacity and age. And the vital capacity drops off with age just as a natural process of the aging process. But that can be reversed through certain, oh, I guess you'd put them in the, it's a kind of a crossover between yoga exercise and athletic exercises and pulmonary function exercises. But basically, there is an interesting golden ratio relationship um, in, with breathing in general that we discovered. And what that is, is that if you, uh, it's easiest to see in this one little exercise I'll give you. We have a thing called the golden breath. And what it is, it's a way to extract maximal oxygen and something called prana, which is the life energy. The reason that's possible is because when you put inhalation and exhalation in a particular ratio, and in this case the golden ratio, you're able to extract more of the life force and oxygen from a given breath. And the reason is that the golden ratio is the prime example of the old expression, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. There's a lot of ways you can use the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But when you put it in golden ratio, you get a, a you, it's kind of like you tap into another realm when things are in perfect ratio, or as they call it, the ancients called it divine proportion. And in this case, we wanted to put exhalation and inhalation in this divine proportion. And it's very simple the way you do that. You can pick two Fibonacci numbers and uh, fib the Fibonacci numbers that are easiest to work with for the breath would be to inhale to three and exhale to five. And that's a very s simplistic way to do it, but extremely powerful. And when you do that, just for even a few minutes, you can feel an extraordinary sense of balance in your body. Blood pressure will come down. Uh, you get a sense of calm. And you can even do it when you're running or exercising, although... Uh, you have to find kind of a steady state because if you're if you're really going into an anaerobic realm, uh, you you kind of need a one to one inhalation exhalation. But anyway, that's a, a simple way to incorporate the golden ratio into your physiology, and it goes into the nervous system, it goes into the blood chemistry. Everything seems to balance out when you breathe in this simple ratio. Now, there's a lot of yoga exercises where they say, oh, breathe in to such a number, breathe out to such a number. Um, there's all sorts of different combinations that people have gotten benefit from. Nobody has ever really talked about using the golden ratio and Fibonacci numbers for breathing exercises. So it would be great if 
people want to experiment with that. And if you have a, a good vital capacity, a deep uh, breath, and you're able to hold your breath for longer, you can, exp- you can go up the Fibonacci sequence. And what I mean by that is the next Fibonacci numbers you could use would be 5 to 8, and then 8 to 13. And you could just walk your way up the Fibonacci sequence as your breath capacity increases. So basically, I've just given, there are two ways I've just given. One is just by increasing your total lung capacity. How much air can your lungs hold? There are separate exercises for that, but that's one way. And the second way is by using the Fibonacci or golden breath, as we call it. Mm. And the importance of breath cannot be understated. It's so important that in our book, we we did a process that Matthew's an expert at called the Hoshin uh, Compass. And what that is, it's a way to prioritize uh, different different things to get their relative value towards one another. And so what we did, we took all of the the, in, the major inputs into health that we could think of, and we tried to prioritize them. Mm. We had exercise, we had nutrition, we had sleep, we had water, we had breathing. And breathing came up to be the number one thing that anybody could do to improve their health and longevity. So this air and breathing thing is so important, and most people are under breathers. And just by correcting that one thing, you could you could have everything else fall into line just by getting that one priority going in your favor. And I'll let Matthew uh, chime in now about his experiences with breathing. Yeah, and and I'll add this thought to it as well because it's stunningly fascinating and simple and practical at the same time because when Bob and I put the essential drivers, we call them drivers of health, performance, longevity, you know, most people in our time, especially in the, in the West, think about fundamentally two factors when we think about health, right? We think about exercise and we think about diet. Sure. Those are the two areas that most people spend the most time thinking about, stressing about, spending the most money on, you know, whether it's gyms or exercise equipment, et cetera, um, and trying to get their diet right. Mm-hmm. But when Robert and I actually sequence these elements, lo and behold, as he said, Air, breathing, came out as the number one foundational driver, really the foundation of the pyramid. Because, see, you can't, you can't out-diet. You can't, no matter how good your diet is, if you're not breathing fully and deeply every breath, you're not going to metabolize and digest and process and utilize and make the most of the food you eat. Yet, for most of us, it's unconscious. We're on autopilot. Right. Unless you're a martial artist, unless you're into yoga, you breathe on autopilot. Most people take it for granted, and most people's capacity is going down over time. We're spending more time doing less, sitting, and hunching our back and crouching over our computer or our our smartphone, and as such, we're compressing our lungs. But breathing is the absolute foundation. It's the number one fuel or food for a human being or any life form, right? Mm -hmm. Mammals, at least. Um, And so, when we did the process and breathing came out number one, and then to, to Bob's point, we started to realize that, you know, when you bring the golden ratio, when you bring it into alignment, when you surface its, its functioning in any process, you automatically tune that process towards optimal. So, for example, when you breathe in, right, to the count of, say, five, and then you exhale to the count of eight, you got a ratio of approximately 1.6, 1 to 1.6, right, to the other. And what that means is, is that you're increasing the dwell time, the dwell time of the oxygen when you take in that, you know, the shorter exhale and then you get the shorter inhale, that is. So you, you know, breathe into the count of five and then you exhale longer to the count of eight. You're maximizing the dwell time of the oxygen. Well, even in athletic performance, this is one of the reasons, again, how I won my first race, is I tuned into the breathing. In the last four minutes of the race especially, you know, this fellow who had beaten me in the past, and I'd taken second place, by the way, in seven different races, mm-hmm. okay? And I'm in, my, I'm, in, I'm in this race, and I'm in the lead, and it's a 5K, and I'm about four minutes from the finish line. I look over my shoulder, and then five seconds behind me is 
you know, a competitor who has beaten me in the past. And I just consciously remembered to tune into my breathing. And I literally, I breathed in shorter and I exhaled longer, even at full out running. And I ended up pulling away from the fellow and winning the race, my first race. Nice. The key point here is that all of us, however, are athletes in one dimension or another. We all want to perform at our best. We all want to live in the present and extract and give the most of this gift of life that we're all endowed with. And so oxygen and the vital life force, as Bob said, the prana, the ancients understood that the air is not just chemically combined, you know, O2 and all these other factors. No, no, no. It's imbued with life force, right? With prana. And so when we increase both the quality and the quantity of every breath, we're going to increase, enhance, and deepen and lengthen the quality and quantity of our lives. And so that was the base of the pyramid. But the shocking thing was, and I'll, I'll round it out with this and then throw the ball to Bob or to you, Greg, with a question. The, the, the amazing thing is, is that when we sequence, for example, the first six drivers of health, performance, and longevity, the oxygen or breathing came out as number one. But diet or nutrition was number four. <laughs> and exercise was number six. Wow. In other words, you have to take care of the foundation, the roots of the tree, if you ever hope to have a bountiful harvest of the fruit of the tree. You see? Yeah. And so that, that combined, our book is really the first book in history on two accounts. One, it distills from a, a leading edge medical doctor's perspective and a, you know, a Fortune 100 life strategist perspective, speaking of me, it distills these core drivers of health, performance, and longevity into a sequence, a critical cross-reinforcing one through 10 sequence. In fact, the chapters in our book are sequenced, chapters one through 10, according to this strategic process that's guiding the best companies like Toyota on the planet. It's, it's their secret wet recipe, their secret weapon strategic plan for success. Mm -hmm. So no one's ever done that before in the field of human health and longevity. But critically, the entire book is infused with the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. They're really, in a sense, um, two sides of the same golden coin, right? All right. This is the first time in history that human health and performance and longevity has had this massive booster shot, this incredible amplifying factor of the golden ratio applied to things as simple and profound as how we breathe to actually how you best combine you know, the macronutrients of carbs, protein, and fat in one's diet and how you can best exercise and so on so that you can support maximum and optimum quality and quantity of life. Boom. <laughs> yeah, man, taking the tools of the mega corporations and giving them to the people. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I love well put, Greg. Well put. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, saying that breath is number one, I'm curious where, where sleep falls into play here because that's one of the things that most people struggle with. I mean, in this dog eat dog, nine to five reality, most people are sleep deprived. But maybe that's one thing they could do without so much um changing of their daily patterns they could possibly get more sleep where where is that on your scale of importance and and how can we actually improve the sleep cycle to get it more in that golden ratio optimization area well take it okay, away I'll bob go on that one. <laughs> take um, it away bob <laughs> yeah I'll take it away here <laughs> L let me just say first that matthew mentioned this plus factor well the name of the book is nature's secret nutrient and that's what we dubbed this plus factor or the secret advantage that you get when you incorporate the golden ratio and Fibonacci sequence into various aspects of your life. So it is natural. That's why we call it nature's. And it is secret because nobody knows about it. <laughs> and it is an actual mm -hmm. nutrient, although on, on the energetic realm. And it doesn't cost anything except the knowledge of it. Once you get that, it doesn't cost anything. And there are zero calories, and you can apply it in so many areas of your life. So I wanted to throw that out there. We neglected to mention the name of the book that encompasses this, this whole process and program. He's good. He's really, really good. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I, I want this. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, so regarding sleep, it's it's so highly misunderstood the way modern man has developed and skewed the sleep cycle. Um, most people probably, you know, would struggle to get six, seven hours a night. But when you apply the principle of the golden ratio to it, you come up with a, kind of an astounding number. And the the golden cut in a 24-hour day would be, see, the golden ratio is, is 0.618 to 1 or Mathematically, you could use 1.618 to 1. It's kind of tricky because it's such a special number. But anyway, around around two-thirds, um, or say 0.6, more like three-fifths um, of a of a 24-hour period would give you somewhere around nine hours of sleep. And that just sounds like totally <laughs> impractical and unbelievable for anybody in this day and age to get nine hours. Right. But when you look at it, in a historical realm, it makes more sense. And even as as early, far back as the 1800s and, and previous to that, humanity went by what was known as a biphasic sleep cycle. And by that, I mean they would have two sleep periods. Maybe they would go to, go to sleep for, say, five hours, and then they would they would wake up in the middle of the night and they would either – get up and read a book, pray, meditate, um, whatever, until they got sleepy again after about an hour. And then they would go down again for another four hours or so. So they were getting around nine hours of sleep. And that seems to be the default programmed uh, brain chip that we have is this biphasic sleep cycle. But with the advent of the electric light, that went by the wayside because people started staying up later and mm -hmm. then they would try and sleep through in one straight shot. And, and by doing that, um, it probably worked for a while where they could sleep maybe eight hours. Some people, if they were lucky, could sleep nine. But then with uh, TVs and electric, uh, more like 24-7 electric lights and Wi-Fi <laughs> and, and all of this, it degenerated further to where even if you tried to get a – uh, one shot of sleep, you were you were lucky if you were able to get five, six, maybe seven hours if you were lucky. And that's where we're at today with a constant bombardment of blue light coming from various sources, computers, and the electromagnetic bombardment that we get all the time. People's sleep cycles are totally thrown off. But the the sleep ended up being the number two driver and that that comes after breathing um, in importance. Actually, actually, just to jump in, Bob, number three, number three. I'm sorry, yeah, number three. Um, so uh, that's how important it is. And if your sleep is off, everything downstream and upstream will be off. So it's important to get the priorities right, the the right amount of amount of sleep. And that's the quantity and the quality of sleep. So everything that you do with the golden ratio, you have to look at quantity and quality. So with the breathing, we had the vital capacity. How much air can you take in? And then the quality, what is the ratio of inhalation to exhalation? So you try and you try and ratio those. And then with sleep, you, you try and get a certain amount of sleep. You try and go for nine hours. Um, and then you want the... You, by automatically doing that, since there's only 24 hours in a, in a day, that gives you a 9 to 15 ratio, which just happens to be the golden ratio. So you get them quantity and quality just by doing that. So once you get your sleep right, you'll feel so much better. And everybody knows that intuitively, but they have to make a special effort to get that. And you can do that with adding in afternoon siestas or naps to try and make up the deficit. Some people do it on the weekend, they sleep in and do whatever they can to get it. But by making a, a conscious effort to do that, the rewards are just unspeakable and everybody should do that. Um, yeah. I neglected to mention um, the number two driver. I got so excited about sleep that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Matthew say a, a few words about uh, the number two driver, which is water. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll just jump in and, and take that because 
the bottom line again is is that each of these drivers is vitally important. They're all vitally important. So it's not about just zeroing in on just one or two or three. They cross reinforce one another. They really make a, an elegant cross reinforcing system. And when you work on all these parts in concert, but really visualizing a pyramid, you really want to have a strong base. And when you especially strengthen the base, the base is breathing. The base is about being conscious with your breath. And it's about, you know, a few times a day, perhaps, remembering to actually breathe with the golden ratio, where you actually inhale, for example, to the count of five and exhale to the count of eight. Mm -hmm. Now, you might hold, you might pause for a second and throw another Fibonacci number. Maybe you want to pause for two or three seconds. So you inhale to five and then you might pause for two or three and then exhale to eight. Well, that's a very simple example of a golden breath. Yeah. That's driver one. Driver two is hydration and water. And what Bob and I, as we went through this, one of our key questions was, you know, how long can people go without these vital nutrients, right? So you can only last X number of minutes, although the world record breath hold is over 23 minutes, where someone actually held their breath for 23 minutes underwater Damn. Um, and survived, to, survived healthy to talk about it. But most of us, we're lucky if we can go a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Water go X number of days, right? At the most. And so hydration is number two. And most of us are underhydrated. Most of us are simply not drinking enough water. And we think about, we get lost or confused in the quantity and trying to really think about input, you know, X number of cups per pound of body weight or whatever, you know, height and all the rest. And simply put, the body itself, again, when it's tuned, has a golden ratio of water. Actually, it's a ratio of inside the cells and outside the cells. So it's kind of extracellular and intracellular. The ratio of the water one to the other is approximately 60-40, 60 to 40%. So and 60-40 is another way to look at the golden ratio, 62-38 more exactly. Mm -hmm. But 60-40 if you're going to be general. And the point is to maintain that ratio and to maintain healthy hydration, right, we simply need to really be tuned into the, our output, the output. So basically what that means is, you know, the, the one's urine color should never get darker than a light Chardonnay. Ideally, it's between clear and a light Chardonnay. Unless you're drinking a lot of vegetable juices <laughs> or you're eating a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of uh, beets and that sort of thing. If the color gets darker than a light Chardonnay, you're underhydrated. And an athlete knows that every percentage point that we drop in hydration compromises performance, stresses the organs in the system. So water within, taking enough water internally and hydrating our largest organ, our skin, without... Uh, those two elements are absolutely vital as driver number two, right? And then that sets the stage for, of course, driver three, sleep. And as Bob said, you know, that is the hidden keystone factor for just about everyone in our culture in our time. Everyone is struggling with getting enough sleep. Everyone thinks they can compromise it and still come out okay. You know, the, the news is, is that when you compromise your sleep, you don't get to make it up. Mm -hmm. And by definition, if you're continuously, chronically underslept, you're shortening your life. And you're also setting yourself up with much higher probability of a massive traumatic effect downstream. For some people, it might be a heart attack. Some people might be a stroke. Some people might be the manifestation of a chronic disease, right? Mm. But the bottom line is sleep is absolutely vital for the foundation of health and longevity. And if you're underslept, you don't get to fully process and take advantage of driver number four, which is nutrition. And I'll, I'll throw the ball to Bob, uh, Greg, unless you've got a follow-up question, around driver four nutrition. Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, this is really intriguing to me because we talk a lot about how disconnected we are from nature. And it's very, you know, it's kind of an abstract concept. Yeah, we see it. We live in these concrete cities. We, you know, aren't really engaged in our natural environment that the earth has provided. But it's also it seems kind of tough to be like, okay, well, how do we fix that? And this this is pretty clear. I mean... If you don't know what to do, look at how nature expresses itself and copy that in as many ways as you can and keep stacking it up, whether it's sleep, nutrition, happiness, uh, the amount of food in your stomach, the amount of water your body's getting. I think it's, it's super interesting and I think it's a really smart way to go about optimal health in a world where we have so much misinformation and competing 
motivations from people who are telling us about our health, I think this is a good fundamental thing to start with. I think you guys you guys nailed it. Well, what we did is, and just and, and I want to throw it to Bob. What we did is, we we really aimed on double S, right? So smart and simple, or as they let you know, as you we've often heard it said, kiss. But I always drop the last S because <laughs> keep it simple, stupid is the most ridiculous and insulting approach. Okay, no, <laughs> that doesn't make anyone feel good or lift them. So we just drop the last S and call it keep it simple because when it's simple, it's doable, it's powerful, it's easy. The great thing about the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence, this is a thing I continuously hammer home, is that it is simple. It is a child can understand and apply these basic core principles. Again, they're all around us once you have the eyes to see. Once you start to learn the knowledge and apply it, it's an infinitely fascinating area of exploration, and it connects, ties, integrates everything in the universe, all the sciences, all the principles and philosophies. It unifies them, and they all elevate when you start to understand through the golden ratio how connected and vibrantly alive every single element of life and matter and structure is. But mm. circling all the way back to this, again, the simplicity, you know, so many people are so focused on counting calories, for example, around diet and nutrition, which is driver four that we surfaced in the process. And so, you know, a logical question is, well, how can you bring the golden ratio into how you eat every day and nutrition? And, you know, I'm happy to throw the ball to you, Bob, on this one, because this is a real area of Bob's expertise. Again, the simplicity, but also the practicality and the power of just looking at your diet through and through a different lens, in this case, the golden ratio. Um, yeah, and I just want to commend Greg for his insight on what you said in your last comment. Uh, what's, what that's called is biomimicry. Mm. And biomimicry is you just look at nature and you see something that's working extraordinarily well that's been developed through evolution over eons. And you try and bring those principles and concepts into something that you're trying to do now, no matter what field you're working in. And so if you bring biomimicry into health and wellness, by bringing the golden ratio in, that's biomimicry at its finest. And so that's what this is all about. Just a couple of things, a couple of points um, before we get into nutrition a little bit. But um, on the hydration, many people don't realize, but a uh, 25-year-old healthy male would have around 62% body water percentage wise. And what happens with age is that goes down. We basically, aging is basically a, a disease of dehydration. You could describe it like that if you wanted to. And yeah, that's why when you see older people, their skin is all shriveled up. They've lost so much hydration in the skin, yeah. but the same process is going on throughout the whole body. Their skeletal, skeletal structure has shrunk. And even though the bones are only 10% water at best, but even even with uh, loss of hydration in the bones, even though there's obviously minerals involved, you can see it in, in a person's posture. But all the internal organs as well lose hydration. And then it goes down to the cellular level that Matthew was mentioning the intracellular and extracellular should be in golden ratio with with um, more towards the um, intracellular. Mm. And when you look at a baby, they're around 90%. And then that kind of oh, re-equilibrates with, with age. And by the time you're 25, you're at the golden ratio. And if you look at Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting or drawing of the Vitruvian man, his physique looks extraordinary. He, he just has a perfect uh, physique, no, no fat on him, perfect posture. He just has the epitome of health in his appearance. Good looking dude. Yeah. And so that is a person who has 62% body water. And Da Vinci, see, he hid all these golden ratios in his drawing, the stuff that we're writing about in this book. You, you can't see all the, all the internal things like DNA, but externally, that 
drawing has the epitome of, of a golden ratio human being. And so that's what we're trying to get people back to. Everybody has their own golden ratio that they were at when they were 25 years old. And that's when all their hormones and all their neurotransmitters and everything was functioning perfectly and just humming in golden ratio. And then with age, due to various stresses or uh, oh, just things that you go through, bad lifestyle habits that people pick up, the aging process sets in in some people more quickly than others. And so the result is what you see in the mirror. And so our goal is to help people turn that around. Hmm. We have a whole chapter on aging in there and things that how you can incorporate these, uh, some of these golden ratio techniques into actually reverse the aging process. One of the main ones is the nutritional approach. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. All we had to do was look at a, nutritional approach that was probably the most successful and rational one out there of all the hundreds of books on diet and nutrition that are out there, the one that shines and has stood the test of time over the last 20 years is The Zone. Everybody's probably heard of The Zone. And yeah, The, the Zone has stood the test of time, and it's the for, so-called 40-30-30 ratio. 40% carbs, 30% protein, and 30% fat. And what we discovered, if you we did a little mathematical trick where if you rearrange the 40, 30, 30 and make it uh, add the 30 and 30 of the protein and fat, that comes up to 60 and you end up with a 40, 60 or very close to the golden ratio. And a lot of the things when we speak of the golden ratio – so there may be some golden ratio Nazis out there that say, well, it is in um, 0.618. Well, for practical purposes and for speaking about it, we can, and for examples, we're going to use the 60-40. And that's actually a, a good Fibonacci ratio anyway. So for practical purposes, that works. And the zone is a moderate, it's not a, a moderate diet. It's not a, it's not a high carb diet. It's not a low carb diet. It's not a high fat diet. It's it's not a low fat diet. Neither a, a high protein or low protein. It's a perfectly balanced diet that probably ninety five percent of people would do well on. And it was it was patterned after the so called Paleolithic uh, people, not patterned after the Paleolithic. Um, paleo diets that you see around now that are a little bit different. But the original paleo diet was the, the zone diet. And that's been uh, substantiated by um, Harvard research. And we have those hmm. listed in our bibliography in our book and we go into further detail on it. But it is the true paleo diet. And it's so simple because it's a moderate diet of moderation. You won't get in trouble doing it. You won't pass out. It'll rebalance almost any chronic disease process towards the golden ratio again. So that is the diet that we, we like to use. And uh, everybody has their own opinion on diet. And some say, oh, this is the zone, you know, that's just, that's just, uh, you know, a, a low carb diet, or some people say it's a high carb diet, whatever, you know, but it seems to work. And it's been probably one of the more rigorously tested diets and it it stands the test of time so that's our that's our sim simple approach to diet um, as far as we go now, go today but there's a lot more in the book that that describes that and again the the ultimate nutrient is nature's secret nutrient and when you eat in the zone the zone ratio the 40 30 30 you get that plus factor you get that indescribable nutrient, nature's secret nutrient, which takes you above and beyond what you're going to get through any other combination of foods that you could come up with. Hmm. That is awesome, man. That's so, so fascinating. And we are really chugging along here. We're at the halfway point now. Matthew, you know, I'm, 
I'm curious how some of these things tie into the amount of success an individual will have in their personal lives. It's something I know you've written about. And as conspiracy people, we have a tendency to see all the mega corporations and ultra rich running amok and all the corruption seems so ingrained and beyond fixing that it can result in a victim mentality, a lack of motivation and a scapegoat for why we don't have success in our lives. But what can we do to fix it, man? Well, I'll, I'll throw one perspective on that um, and then throw the ball uh, back to Bob. But from my perspective, Greg, I mean, I, since as from a young age, I've always been really interested in going to the root, you know, go to the root cause. You really want to you want to talk about how to transform, improve and transform your life. You've got to go to the root driving factors. Right. Mm -hmm. So even going to the very root of the word conspiracy, most people and it's that the word has been hijacked to a large degree. Because by definition, conspiracy simply means, con means together, and spiracy is spirit. So together in spirit is what conspiracy means. Well, guess what? We can have a conspiracy of hope, a conspiracy of truth, it's a true. conspiracy of transformation, right? But the word has actually been hijacked only in its negative connotation. So how do you, how do you join a conspiracy? How do you start a conspiracy? How do you be part of a conspiracy to elevate and reclaim restore your power. Well, one of the ways is to realign yourself. It's not something you have to you have to stress a lot and struggle a lot at. You can simply step back and realign yourself with natural principles of order and balance and harmony and abundance which the universe is, which of course the golden ratio represents elegantly and simply. So to learn, again, learning is the only strategic advantage any of us has at any age, any culture, is learning. Learning the right stuff, the good stuff. Learning about reclaiming one's power and putting it into practice. When we start to do that and start that chain reaction, then we can start to reclaim our individual power because it all starts from within. Right? We've been to a certain degree brainwashed that you know, others are going to save us, the latest candidate uh, whatever office is going to be our savior. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all know in our heart of hearts, that's just, that's, it's backwards, right? That we have to reclaim the, you know, what Lincoln said years ago, you know, we're meant to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, the first term there is of the people, and that's you and me. And so we need to reclaim that consciously, the work that, that Bob and I are doing with the Golden Ratio is one very, very strong element in that regard. Because, look, if you don't have your health and you're not making that a front and center priority, then everything else in your life is compromised. The quality of your thinking, your energy, your commitment, tenacity, perseverance, ability to, to not only take care of yourself but also be a beacon and be an inspiration – right, make a difference in the world, that's also compromised. So that's a real central focus of the work that we're doing together. And, you know, the work that I'm doing in the corporate world has multiple facets, but one of its core anchors is the restoration of health physically, spiritually, emotionally, physically, right, from a standpoint of freedom. Those are real core elements in my corporate workshops and teachings with the Fortune 500 and bringing to bear processes like the golden ratio in nature secret nutrient in our, our latest book and in the workings of bringing these principles back to life to conscious awareness and practice mm -hmm. the hoshin process which is the foundation for my work with the fortune 500 which is essentially the strategic planning system the inner compass guidance system that the japanese created inspired by the teachings of the man behind what I submit is the greatest business success story never told. Um, this gentleman who is responsible for quality as a worldwide strategy for mm. product and service uh, across the globe and has generated untold trillions of dollars in increasing value far beyond any individual we can think of, whether it's Gates or Jobs or Edison or you know Rockefeller, you name it. This gentleman's work over the last six decades, which continues to affect every company and organization on the planet to this day, is a literal goldmine for increasing the value of the work you do in your life at any scale. Whether you're just starting out of high school or whether you're a CEO or whether you're a leading entrepreneur, when you bring the art and science of quality, 
principles, by the way, a 10-year-old can understand and integrate and apply, you automatically reclaim your power, Greg, is probably where this is all coming back to. That Hmm. transformation of our culture, transformation of society, transformation of the world must begin with transformation of the individual. And we have to know, we have to truly know, have the faith, put the faith into practice, that that power resides within each and every one of us. And it comes, really starts fundamentally from my perspective with realizing that we're all blessed with a purpose and a passion and a meaning, a destiny for being alive in this time. And so when we start to gravitate and start to invite and learn and practice these sorts of principles, we start to reawaken our unique gift and turn up the light of our unique power to really make a difference and make the most of this incredibly precious gift that sometimes we take for granted called our lives (laughs) well said man i really did like your talk on quality i did get to see that and you this individual that you referenced here is uh i guess dr uh, w edward deming yes and we we should spend just a, a minute on this tell people why he is so influential and how it ties into japan yes 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 well this is i have a i i'm i'm on a uh uh an accelerated track. So next year, one of the books that's one of my new books is coming out is called "The Greatest Business Success Story Never Told," and how you can profit from it. And for your listeners, I'll, I'll let uh, we'll let them all in on the secret, okay? Because <laughs> because Deming is not in the title of the book on purpose. But here's the story, and it's this it's a story that one in ten thousand might have a have an inkling of this gentleman's name, but they won't they won't necessarily know the impact. So in a thumbnail. Dr. W. Edwards Deming was an American statistician who was born in 1900 at the turn of the century. And he became a statistician. He was a systems expert, not IT systems, but the understanding that everything we do in life is a series of steps, a system that leads to an outcome. And the more we understand bird's eye view, the system we're engaged in, whether it's the system of our day, right, beginning, middle and end, or the system of a company, the delivery of a product or service, when we understand and tune that system continuously towards perfect, we can elevate the quality of the output. Okay, Deming, goes, Deming was involved in the, the United States victory in World War II. He's like this Forrest Gump in history. He wrote and taught the quality standards that largely determined the quality of everything the United States produced during the war. The quality of our ammunition, guns, tanks, planes, the whole, the whole nine yards was was directly benefited from Deming's work, such that everything we produced during the war exhibited made in Japan quality we know today. Five years after the war ended in 1950, Dr. Deming was over in Japan to help with the census. And at that point, Japan had been bombed to the ground, as we know. We dropped two atom bombs on them, and they were, they were absolutely desolate. They were spiritually bankrupt, industrially bankrupt, and just a defeated nation with nowhere to go but up. They were starving in the streets. It's hard to imagine, but at that point, Japan was literally destroyed as a country. And MacArthur's over there with, you know, with the United States occupying forces, and Deming's over there to help with the census. And fundamentally, uh, the suggestion was given to Dr. Deming, why don't you share what we were doing during the war in America with Japanese industry to help them rebuild their war-shattered economy? Long story short, starting in 1950, Deming lectured. Within two years, he had reached 80% of the leaders of the nation's, Japan's remnants of industry. And he made a famous prediction in 1950. He said to the Japanese, look, if you will learn the essential principles and techniques and methods I will teach you, I predict within five years, you'll be an exporting nation. See, at that time, Japan was importing everything, food, fuel, materials, the works. No one wanted anything made in Japan. For those of us who remember Back to the Future, uh, with Doc and Marty McFly, you know, made in Japan was an international joke. The, the toys and the equipment that would break quickly and so forth, not, no, no reputation whatsoever for quality, quite the reverse. Deming predicted the Japanese, if you learn what I'm going to teach you and put it into practice, I predict by 1955, you'll turn the tide. They put their head down and they beat the prediction by a year. In 1954, the balance of trade swung and it began a worldwide tidal wave of quality with Japan at the lead. Okay? Mm. And, and, That's why I call Dr. Deming the Einstein of quality and success. And I'm coming to why I submit he is the architect of the greatest business success story in history, never told. So 
the Japanese kept their head down and continuously improved everything they built and made. In the 1970s, they started to surpass America. And American industry, Ford, General Motors, you know, our electronic industry started to sink by the head rapidly because everyone wanted what the Japanese w were making. Higher quality products and goods that performed more predictably and longer and kept their value longer. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, eventually ended up costing less. And so Americans started to cry for protection from the evil Japanese who have been mm -hmm. taught by an American. In fact, the highest award you can win in Japan even today in 2015, going back to 1951, is called the Deming Prize. And it's, it's awarded amid, amidst great fanfare, like the Oscars in the United States. Every year, it's televised. And it's considered the Nobel Prize of Quality and Success in Japan. Imagine the United States if our highest award for business success was called the Ishikawa Prize. And it was named after a Japanese citizen. I think there'd be a story there. <laughs> so long story short, in 1980, a friend and colleague of mine named Claire Crawford Mason, who was a... Uh, uh, NBC News producer and reporter was charged with figuring out why is American industry sinking by the head? And so she started to investigate. She interviewed the Japanese heads of companies and they all said, well, it's Dr. Deming. And she said, Dr. Who? And they said, no, not Dr. Who, Dr. Deming. And she found out that he was 80 years old, still practicing in his basement office, 20 minutes from the White House, and no one in the Carter administration had ever heard of this guy. Okay. And so she went to interview him. And she figured, you know, it's worth at least stopping by. And she goes into his basement office and he's, Dr. Deming's 80 years old and he's muttering about how America's committing economic suicide and we've got to get quality back into America or we're going to, we're going to, you know, our children are going to wake up in a land where their standard of living is lower than their parents and so forth. And Claire thought, well, God, this guy's really eccentric and he's got a chip on his shoulder. And then he pulled out the headlines from the 1960s showing Emperor Hirohito awarding him the highest award you can award a non-Japanese born citizen for basically saving the Japanese economy and being responsible for the Japanese economic miracle. And she thought, well, there might be a story here. <laughs> she put him on NBC News in what is now called in history the second most impactful documentary in history. Dr. Deming was reintroduced to the world at age 80 in 10 minutes on this special. It was called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? It's broadcast in June of 1980 on NBC. And that in, reintroduce the science and art of quality to the world. We're talking all the service companies, the manufacturing companies, automotive, power plants, military. We're talking every sphere of life on planet Earth. Okay? And from that point forward, quality became an imperative strategic element in every single business on the planet. You had quality, you not only survived, you thrived, you took the market. And so we, you know, businesses, and again, it doesn't matter if it's a service business, an entrepreneur, mom and pop, or Toyota, you sink, you swim, or you fly, depending on the quality you've got in your product, your service, and its delivery. And so yeah. untold trillions of dollars in value and growing have resulted from the humble teachings of this unknown American, Dr. W. Edwards Deming. So he's the foundation for the work that I do on the corporate side and the retreats that I lead. And, of course, Ho Shin, which is the strategic planning system that Dr. Deming inspired, is a methodology for basically setting the stage for highest quality in one's life, in one's business, and in one's industry. And, parallel, and I'll end with this, it also sets the, the elements in place, the cornerstones in place, to invite the harmony and alignment of the golden ratio into one's business and life and practice. Man, I think that is a, an amazing story. I'm glad you told it because today everybody thinks about the culture of Japan as being uh, one that strives for excellence. All of our electronics are Japanese. Everything I'm looking at on my desk here is Japanese. And we take that for granted, but there's a, there's a reason for that. You know, there is a, a methodology that got them there. And I think it's definitely important that everybody thinks about their own passion you know, because I doubt it's working in uh, the cubicle at AT&T for 40 years. I doubt it's being the best burger flipper. But if you take your passion and whether you always know exactly what you're doing with it, if you focus on quality, if you make sure the quality is there, a lot of things will fall into place. I think that is uh, a lesson worth spending some time on. Well, and when I'll just, just, to quickly, uh, just to quickly add a thought to that, Greg, and then I want to just open it up for, for Bob to share his perspective as well. Because, see... We have, we have done, again, something that hasn't been done in history before. We've brought quality, the science of quality, to health, 
to performance and longevity mm -hmm. and the art and science of the golden ratio to bear as well. So we brought multiple vectors or angles of breakthrough cross-reinforcing support to deepening the quality and extending the quality of one's life. Okay, but right back to personal transformation and just to spend a few moments on what you just said, because I think it's extremely well said. And that is Dr. Deming was adamant that we all deserve joy and pride and purpose in our work day to day. And when we're in a system again, going right back to the educational system, and it's not an accident. Okay, the consolidation of power in our time and the consolidation of wealth in our time is not an accident. It is engineered. There is no doubt whatsoever. Okay? Amen. And so what we're talking about here is we're talking about how do you restore, reclaim, reactivate your innate power as a human being. Okay? And part of it is going back to the foundational principles of the Constitutional Republic of the United States. You know, when Jefferson wrote about, you know, we're, we're endowed with these rights, these unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It goes right back to that because, you know, it's now becoming it's now becoming science. It's common sense, but it's science that if you don't have happiness in your life, and by the way, the golden ratio factors directly into how you can increase the daily happiness and fulfillment in your life. But if you don't have happiness in your life, and we're not talking Pollyanna rose colored glasses all the time because life is in waves, but if you don't have consistent, predominant happiness in your life, you're never going to be able to share your gifts right? On a consistent basis. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if we don't step out of the media and step into our own power and start to write our own script, write our own story, lead our lives with greater passion and alignment with our purpose, then we're never going to be able to truly, you know, make the most of our lives for ourselves, for our families and communities and for the world. It has to be and is an inside job. Happiness is an inside job. So <laughs> I'll close with this thought that you know, Deming was adamant about this. If we want to have world transformation, it has to start with personal transformation. That's the base of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Man, very awesome. That just about does it for us. Thanks so much for being here and bringing the brilliant Dr. Friedman along for the ride. I had a great time with both of you. Hopefully the people can use some of this stuff to improve themselves. But before we go, I did want to give you some time to tell the people about other things you got going on and remind people where they can keep up with you and where they can pick up this Golden Ratio and Fibonacci Sequence book that I have right here. Sure, sure. And just very simply put, um, for all of, of those out there listening, um, to learn more about the work that I'm doing and Dr. Friedman is doing, uh, simply go, simply go on to uh, the internet. We have a Facebook page. Um, you can plug in my name, which is Matthew Cross and Dr. Robert Friedman, and you'll go to our books on Amazon. They're all on Amazon. Um, and for, again, for, as a, as a special treat, as a special consideration for listeners of Greg's show, you like a copy of the golden ratio and Fibonacci sequence, the full color, you know, 300 photographs in color, uh, portal. It's about 62 pages long. It's up on Amazon for $16. We'll send it to you for just shipping and handling for $5. Send an email. Send me a direct email, and my office will get it, mc1618 at gmail.com, or go to my company's website, which is leadershipalliance.com, and you can check out the TED Talk I did by just punching in my name, Matthew Cross, into the YouTube search engine. You'll pull it right up. It's a four-minute talk I did. Uh, on the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, I, I love questions. I love engagement. So if anyone wants to find out more, those are all good places to start. And um, all I can say is, Greg, thanks a million, you know, on my behalf, on Bob's behalf for this opportunity and this exploration, because this is, you know, this is where the fun is. This is where the power is. And for all your listeners, all I can say is you're in the right place. You're in the right time. And uh, go forth and conquer. <laughs> and uh, hey, this is this is what it's all about. It's a, just a delight being here. Right on, man. Yeah, you got it. it. It was a blast. Another great time to add to the list. Much appreciated. Take care of yourself out there and keep living the Phi life. <laughs> Take care, man. And boom goes the dynamite there. You have it, guys. A little different than the track we've been on lately, but I think it still holds a lot of value. Some things like sleep and breathing and drinking water might seem a little elementary, but honestly... Do we all do these things properly? I know I don't breathe right. After 30 years, you'd think I'd have it down, but I have horrible lung capacity. I can't even run out to the mailbox. But I've had several guests 
talk about the importance of breath and meditation and out-of-body experiences, and I don't doubt that. It's just hard for me to take the time and think about it, but I've been trying the 3-5 exercise this week, and honestly, it does seem to make a difference. So even if you get just that out of it, I think it's pretty valuable. Besides, when was the last time I had a guest who offered their book for free? That is pretty damn nice of them. I had no idea they were going to do that, and I actually got a little nervous because there are a lot of you guys out there listening, but let's take them up on the offer. I don't think there's anyone who couldn't learn a bit more and maybe apply a few of these techniques to their lives. I'll post Matthew's email below with this show. He also asked me to make him a plus account so he could interact with you guys and answer some questions or anything. That seems to be the place where comments are the most active. So don't be shy and please don't be animals either. Please be kind to him for taking the time. I know we're not discussing spider beans, crimes of the Rockefeller Rothschild Banking Syndicate, or an underground race of giants, but you can't do much with those things but wonder. And I think Matthew said it best in there somewhere that if you aren't operating efficiently, if you're weak and tired and run down, how can you fight the system? How can you make the changes you might want to make in life? It's no use analyzing in detail all the campaigns against humanity if you aren't going to also study how to be at the top of your game, you know? I think those are valid points. So after the first hour, Dr. Friedman had to go, and so me and Matthew went the Plus Show alone and talked more about attracting wealth and abundance and an exercise to restart your imagination's natural creative powers of manifestation that so many teachers and occultists say is possible. We also get into the pentagram and Matthew's thoughts on magic, how the golden ratio in corporate logos contributes to their success, that your credit card is even proportioned to the golden ratio. How about that for money magic, huh? And we dedicated a good amount of time to talking about the Armenia trip in the Plus Show. Both of us had some decent insights from it. Uh, Marty Leeds even chimed in with a encoding of pie that he noticed in one of my photos. Anyway, I thought it was a good, positive departure before we dive right back into the weeds next week. The last show of the month, I finally got caught up. Six shows in September, right? I think so. Marie Jones, Professor Doom, David Noakes, Harold Coates Vela, and now Matthew Cross and Robert Friedman. And then number six, in just a few days, will be the scholar, the gentleman, the Jim Mars. I'm also going to choose a Money Bomb winner in the next 48 hours, so watch those emails, and I'll see you then. I've done all I can. Your move, underbreathers. Your frickin' move. Coward, it's your show now. So what's it gonna be? Cause people will tune in to hear another new conspiracy. Almost too much of we thought this was low. It's bad, getting worse, so where'd all the good people go? They're on the higher side chats cause it's everybody's favorite show. Where'd all the good people go? He got your Mars coat in white and then there's Crow. They talk this and that on the higher side chat testing one two now what you gonna do bad news misuse got too much to lose give me some truth now whose side we on whatever you say turn on the boob tube i'm in the mood to obey so lead me astray by the way now where'd all the good people go they locked them up it seems for protesting monsanto Where'd all the good people go? They're on the THC, my favorite show. Sitting down, new episode to hear. Wanna light a bolt, but I fear the police. Can you hear me? Can't interrupt me from this friendly conversation. Waiting all week for THC With the car wood There's no hesitation
temptation Exposing the truth, getting to the elite Scams, schemes, conspiracies and treason It's an excellent show, what I need to know Is where'd all the good people go? Been only getting hate and fear from all the other hoes Where'd all the good people go? Guess that makes THC my favorite show. Where'd all the good they people go? They talk this and that on the highest side chat testing one two. Now what you gonna do? Bad news, misuse. Got, give me some truth. You got too much to lose. Whose side are we on today? Anyway, okay, whatever you say. Wrong and resolute, but in the mood to obey. Station to station, desensitizing the nation. Going gone. As you mop up the remnants of your melted mind, consider this the high quality, commercial free show you just enjoyed is what we call THC Free. But you can spend twice as much time with Greg Carlwood and all his great guests by becoming a member of the Higher Side Chats Elite for just $5. And you'll get the five extended two-hour episodes that come out each month. Because an honest, open-minded, and uncensored exploration into the fringe will never be brought to you by your corporate overlords, but rather must be funded by the loyal listeners willing to take that ride. So join at thehiresidechatsplus.com and on top of twice as much show, get your own easy-to-use RSS feed URL for convenient listening on any device. Suggest guests on your member profile, comb through the archives of all the ones you missed, and continue the conversation even further on the new THC Plus Forum, where you can scratch that higher side itch in between shows with the rest of us and hold your head up high, knowing that your subscription supports a show you love, produces the free version for everyone else, and stands as a small act of rebellion against those nefarious puppet masters of the power pyramid. Treat yourself. It's time.